Good afternoon, folks. This is your captain speaking. Thank you for choosing Quill 18 Airlines today, powered by X-Plane 10. X-Plane is a uh, flight simulator, of course, and it is considered to be one of the flight simulators with possibly uh, the most advanced and detailed uh, flight model there is. Uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator X is a tiny bit more popular, but um, X-Plane is also very, very well supported by third-party tools and lots of um, fan mods and that sort of thing. For example, the Toronto Skyline that you're seeing here is actually a fan-made creation. It does, the game does feature uh, sort of scenery and sort of just geometry and, and textures from all around the world. Uh, and one of the problems that used to be with X-Plane is that while the base version was sort of, you know, kind of a reasonable AAA title kind of price, you also had to pay for the DVDs, yes, DVDs of all the scenery. Uh, since it's appeared on Steam, it's actually quite handy in that the uh, the base game, still again, it's going to be 50 or $60, or less if you pay it for it or you buy on sale, but um, the actual scenery DLC is available for free. You just have to go into uh, Steam and check the box for which ones that you want loaded, just in case you want to save some hard drive space and you don't necessarily need to fly to Asia today. Then you can basically fly all over the world. So here we are in Toronto. Again, the, the scenery over here is just an extra fan download, and there's a lot of that. If you want some extra planes, for example, um, if we go into the aircrafts over here, I, uh, I actually went and downloaded the... Um, the DC-8, 400 and 100, which are planes that are very common to fly out of um, out of Sudbury, Ontario, where I live, and fly to Toronto, for example. Specifically, I was able to get the actual livery for Porter Airlines, which is the airline that actually would fly me to Billy, Billy Bishop Airport, which is where we are right now, also known as uh, Toronto City Centre Airport or the uh, Toronto Island Airport very sort of regional kind of thing. Uh, what we're going to be doing for today's flight is we're going to be uh, taking off towards the east over here. We're going to circle back around and do an extremely illegal low level, low level buzz through of Toronto. And then when we come out on the other side, we're going to continue going west for some time. Uh, and then uh, until we're south of um, Pearson International Airport and turn north into that and then try to land at Pearson. Now, I hope that all of your uh, paperwork is up to date because I am very terrible at flying these planes and especially terrible at landing them, so there's a good chance we're going to crash, but that's a lot of fun. Uh, the graphics are far from turned up to the maximum. Um, the game, like any flight simulator, can be almost infinitely, um, I don't know, buffed to show super high quality textures, uh, super far distant rendering, and that sort of thing. Now, where we are now, again, because I downloaded sort of this, this fan um, pack for for Toronto, uh, there's not any procedurally generated geometry, but there tends to be a lot of it throughout the world. If you go to a city, uh, there'll be procedurally generated roads, buildings, so on and so forth. You won't necessarily be able to get to the actual landmarks, like say the CN Tower, um, normally, but every city is there. And basically every airport throughout the world, including extremely minor ones, are available in the game. And again, with those scenery packs, you can basically fly wherever you want. And there are, I hope you noticed, some extremely big airplanes there. Um, so these general aviation ones are sort of, you know, standard sort of, you know, limited seating, you know, four to ten people maybe. And then when you get the heavy metal, you get some big stuff, including the uh, Boeing 747 that can carry the space shuttle, for example. Then you can play, yeah, and just big jumbo jets and things like that. These Dash 8s I downloaded and with the right livery. And, ah, it's just, it's just fantastic. There's just so much stuff. There's helicopters. There's radio control planes. There's all sorts of nonsense um, if you want, which is which is pretty cool. Anyway, let's, let's go ahead and take off. Um, and, and give you a sense of the, the experience here. The normal view has this sort of flat textured version of the cockpit, which is really, really easy to work with. Um, but if you want something that looks a little bit better, you can also go into this 3D mode. The only thing with 3D mode is, you know, with wind and turbulence and just general head bob, is every now and again you'll be fiddling with one of the knobs, and because the view shifts ever so slightly, you'll go from the plus, and, you know, you can see here, it's like twiddling between pluses and minuses as the view just sort of shifts around. So it can sometimes be a little bit inconvenient. You can bookmark views um, to get various close-ups and things like that if you want. And you can also look around. We can see the back seat over there. Very plush leather seats. It looks like it would be very, very comfortable. Anyway, let's go to the forward view. So uh, we're just gonna go ahead and uh, and take off as is. There is a full air traffic control. There's the ability to like register a, fly a flight plan. Um, you know, ask for clearance and do all those things. Uh, you can also, um, depending on where you start, Sometimes you have to taxi over there, like one of the starts, for example, would have us uh, start off um, parked over here, and then we could taxi by following these lines all the way over here, get to the end of the runway, and then take off. Um, but I've just set us up to be relatively easy there because, uh, because I'm lazy. 
So we got temperature gauges. I believe we can, is it this button? Yeah, toggle between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Little details like that are great. We can even open the doors. You can do this mid-flight, by the way. Uh, if, you know, you really want to scare yourself, that's fine too. Or your passengers. Um, and yeah, lots of things can be interacted with this way, but also everything can be hotkeyed. If we take a look at the controls, uh, joystick and equipment, and you can see here all the key binds and things that you can key bind to every potential button on your joystick. I'm actually going to be using the Xbox 360 controller, which is a great way of doing it. And then all the hotkeys as well. It is crazy, crazy, crazy detailed. Um, and I only know about maybe 10% of this. So uh, all I can do is try not to crash. Anyway, without further ado, let me grab the Xbox controller and throttle up and disengage the brakes. So I've got the uh, the right stick on my Xbox controller configured to uh, handle the rudder in the back, which mostly I use to steer on the ground. Uh, I'm not very good at doing the whole step on the ball thing on the, uh, uh, I don't know, the turn coordinator uh, to make my turns super smooth, so, you know, deal with it. Oh, and you know what, I actually forgot to set a few very important things before I take off, mostly regarded, related to the, uh, the autopilot. Oops. Oh, well, that'll be fine. Speed's up to 80, it's more than enough for us to take off at this point. Uh, and we can get some nice external views if we want. Woo! Wobble up and down. Whoa! We want to make our passengers sick. Get a nice sort of flyby camera over here. Vroom. And let's keep going straight. Now I'm going to try to level out just a little bit while I fiddle with uh, this little meter over here. I'm just going to try to set the auto... Actually, I don't really need the autopilot at this point. You know what? Let, let's leave it. Let's leave it off the autopilot for now. We'll just try to more or less fly straight while I try to put this back to the west. Er, maybe. Again, it's a little hard to do in the uh, the 3D view because things tend to shift a little bit, especially if it's windy. All right, we're going to call that good enough. Uh, so, yeah, again, this is going to be anything but a, uh, a nice, gentle flight. Um, we can go to, is it view? View number four I quite like. Because here we can actually, like, zoom around our plane. And we can get an appreciation for the graphics. They're quite nice, nice little boats going around. The city in the background. And in the background, the land is mostly flat where we don't have the sort of like extra geometry from this fan-made pack. Uh, but on the other hand, and while it looks a little goofy here, when you're up in the air from quite high and looking down on it, it looks fantastic. And it looks it looks perfect. It looks exactly the way that it probably should look. We can also toggle into a just a heads-up display mode if you want like more vision. Uh, but it's you know certainly far from realistic. This is the, that 2D mode again. But I'll stick with 3D mode. I think it's uh, quite nice. Although, we may want to just back up a little bit like that. There we go. Yeah, you can even see the uh, the sun, sun visors up top. Some planes have uh, controls and things that you can do here. So the reason I'm not using the air traffic control is because they'd be yelling at me like crazy right now. What the hell are you doing flying in the middle of the city? Uh, it's fine. I love the BMO building. Again, you know, fan packs and things like that. So... Uh, but it means, you know, if you've got a favorite city, you can usually find a lot of high-quality content for it. Like, I was surprised to find a, a, a good version of the Billy Bishop Airport, considering it's so kind of minor and insignificant. Um, I'm going to try to sort of kind of level out here. But uh, we'll see what we can do. Anyway, there, there's Toronto. Uh, I believe it's the biggest city in Canada, I'm pretty sure by far. It is, of course, not our national capital. It is the capital of Ontario, the most populous province in Canada. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of Canadians feel it gets a little bit too much attention. People who live outside of Ontario keep saying, oh, Ontario gets all the attention, and so, you know, it's the focus of Canadian politics. And as someone who lives in northern Ontario, I say, listen, we get screwed way worse than you guys do. Trust me. But southern Ontario, and especially the Toronto area, man, they do get a heck of a lot of attention. Anywho, at this point, we're done our, our flyover of Toronto. So now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and engage the autopilot. So I'm going to make sure to, um, to fiddle with this and get it to be... I don't know if you guys can see the little yellow blip here. Let me try to zoom in without crashing the plane while I'm not looking at the front. The little yellow bit shows us where to uh, where we're tuning the autopilot to go. And if I do enable the autopilot, so now the flight director is on, go to auto, turn on the heading mode, it'll steer itself. And then if I click the alt button here, it's actually going to lock in on our current altitude, which is just over 2,000 feet. And it's going to try to maintain that for me while also trying to keep a 270 heading, which of course is directly west. I believe over here in the distance, we can actually see Pearson at this point. Uh, it's worth noting you can basically go anywhere in the world. You can uh, use this option here to basically find any airport you would like in the world and teleport there instantly. Um, you could also, if you wanted to, open up the planet map 
and spin that around and basically park yourself wherever you might want to go. And we're today we're just going to use the local map over here to get information about where we are. This is where we took off from. You can see the path that we took, which is kind of a handy thing to have going on. Um, if I zoom out, I can see Pearson over here, which is a gargantuan, gargantuan airport. Uh, what I'm going to do just to make sure I don't um, overshoot too far is because um, how on, hang on, I've got a list of the um, the runways on my other screen over here. So we've got uh, if I try to come in from the south, the best thing I can do is take runway 24. So the uh, runway numbers are it, work with um oh no that's that's coming for a little bit more from the west than i want oh 15 15 would work so that means um at 150 one is is what you'd want to aim uh that's the wrong direction 330 is what i want runway 33 which 15 and 33 are the same runways um they just go in opposite directions and it's 150 because on your compass zero is north 90 is east 180 is south 270 is west so if i take runway 15, which is 150, I know what direction, um, or again, 33, it's the same one. So I want to be going at 330 degrees, so virtually north. So that's that's the ideal that I want. So um, assuming that this VOR is relatively close, I can use this as a bit of a guidance, and that's a coordinate 116.55, or frequency 116.55, which I actually have tuned over here already. And what you can do with these bad boys is um, you use it as a locator. It's very old school technology. Yeah, you can get GPS in these planes. Um, I think this plane, yeah, this this stack here, you can click on some of these things and interact with it, actually has a GPS, a very simple one. Um, but it technically has a GPS that we can use to fly. But we're going to do it a little bit more old school. So ideally, I'd like to come in on radial 33, I guess. And you can see the uh, that little meter, that little dial change. If I, if I tune this... To exactly where it's in the middle like this so I'm at roughly we're gonna call it 292 from the airport but what I really want to do is line myself up so that I'm roughly on the 33 or the 330 because that's roughly the way that um, that runway goes now the VOR that I'm following the radio signal that I'm following is actually set slightly to the west so it's not entirely accurate but it'll give me an idea right now I'm going directly west when this starts to move, I'm going to turn so that I'm facing on the 33, and it should start to line me up relatively well. Um, what we're going to do is we got a little bit of time to kill, and we've got tons of radios in here. We can listen to air traffic control, we can listen to other airplanes, we can listen to the weather report, all kinds of jazz. I'm going to disable the, um, the alt altitude lock, and I'm just going to... Oh really, if I use the trim, it disables the autopilot completely? Including the direction thing? Well, that's kind of annoying. I didn't realize that. Okay, so we'll manually try to keep the west while we also very slowly descend. I'm going to kill my speed just a microscopic amount, but mostly I'm just going to aim my nose down. Of course, the funny thing with an airplane is always if you nose down, then you tend to go faster, which means your airplane will naturally want to go up. So you're, you're trying to work to keep these forces in balance. I'm just trying to very, very slowly to descend about a thousand feet, which will uh, hopefully make the landing a little bit easier. You can see how, how absolutely jerky I am with this. It doesn't help that the Xbox 360 has a very, um, like, a, a small stick, so it doesn't have a whole lot of room to maneuver. But um, I'm still, I'm just very twitchy and jerky. It'd be a lot easier if I had a proper yoke kind of set up for this. Anyway, let's, let's try to descend a little bit. Uh, I guess I should really use the trim to do this. I? So you can actually see, I, there's a hotkey on the keyboard that I'm using for this. But you can see as I do this, I'm actually going to work the trim. And then I can keep my hand off the stick and just try to achieve the rate of descent I want that way. That's a little too much. There we go. Coming up a little bit. Meanwhile, I'm pretty sure I should see this needle start to move soon. I'm pretty sure Pearson is... Actually, it's right there. Yeah, but I think the beacon that we're following is way over there. So, with that in mind, go ahead and uh, make our turn. And we're just going to land sort of at random. So, again, not a pro with the instrumentation. Also, like, these, some of these beacons don't make as much sense, given the big distances. What would make a heck of a lot more sense. I wonder if I can use the ILS. Yeah, I'm bad at these.
these electronics, but if I go to the, um, the map over here, so the runway I want is 33, so there's two of them, there's left and right, we're going to go 33 right, so that is 1030. Isn't this radial, doesn't, I'm confused, doesn't that mean the angle? No, anyway, 1030, so if I go, I don't remember, there's a way to pause the simulation. I go and tune, say, this second nav, and use the small knob, er, slow down a bit, and loop around, er, with the small knob, to the 30, and then bring it down a level, bring it, where's the minus, there, there we go. I was going to say, I should be able to get some information there. Now, I am, I got to be higher. There we are. I can line up. I can use this to line up my approach properly. Now, the only thing that messes me up in these views is I'm used to thinking that I have to line this up sort of where I'm sitting, but it's actually the, the middle of the screen is the thing that's important. Okay, let's, let's give it a little bit more juice. Make sure we've got no flaps. We're, we're too low as is. There we go. Now you can see us coming into the middle. We are going to have to bleed off some speed relatively soon. There we are. We've got to go a little bit further to the right. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the X to be right in the middle, ideally. So I'm going ahead, I'm taking out the throttle, I'm going to give it one level of flaps. And you can see right away I start to rise up. Flaps let you fly more slowly without sort of stalling out. So now I'm, I'm way too high. So let's let's kill the juice a lot more, which will cause me to sink like a stone. And then I'll deploy some flaps. Hopefully I'm not coming in too short. I probably am. A little bit more juice, not much more. It'd be nice to switch to an external view, but I really need to uh, watch myself. I'm also way crooked. Let's adjust that. Luckily I'm flying a very small plane, which can also land very very slowly. All right, I've killed all my speed. I'm going to try to get low, but not quite touch down until I get all my flaps out. Because right now I'm still going much, much too fast for landing. It's a good thing this is a runway that's long enough for a 747. And here I am with my little Cessna 172. There we go. You can see the airspeed is bleeding off because I'm no longer just descending. I don't have my nose down. So I'll deploy whoops, this way. All my flaps, all my flaps, all my flaps, and come to a nice gentle rest. It's going to be a lot harder to do it from this view, actually. There we go. Come on. Whoop. Oh, bounce like that is never a good form. But there we go. Stick the nose, and let's hit the brakes. And there we go. <laughs> it's very hard to steer left and right when you're looking at yourself from the opposite direction. Go into the front view over here, and there we go. I can actually um, disengage the brake, give myself a little bit of juice, just a tiny bit, and then get the hell off the runway before I get crushed by a big plane who probably actually radioed, radioed in. I, I believe I have the airport traffic set to be relatively low, so we're not seeing too many other planes in the air right now, but you can tune it really, really high and get a lot of airplanes going all over the place, um, especially in the full dynamic airports. There could be something going on here. Anyway, let's, uh, let's go ahead and just hit the gas and take off on grass. Sure! That's the one advantage of having little planes, that you can do really, really, really ridiculous things like this. Try to stay relatively straight. We can't quite build up enough speed on the grass here, but it's about to smooth out. There we go. If you do do a crash landing, I mean, you can, A, die. You can also damage the plane from landing too hard. You can also damage the plane from uh, being a little bit too aggressive in the air which is kind of interesting. It is a lot harder to do with these smaller planes uh, because they're, again, they're pretty bulletproof, but with the bigger ones, it is especially easy to sort of, I don't know, rip their wings off, I suppose. There you go, with the Sheridan, you can stay there. And there you go, I hope you enjoyed this quick little look at uh, X-Plane. Um, actually, I've always loved flight simulators, and I feel like I might be spending a little bit more time into this, um, and uh, I want to try some other flights. It would be nice to get better at flying like the big big planes, but I'm not sure that I can go right to the big jets. Maybe I'll take like a, a dual prop plane and do a slightly bigger flight, 
Again, I could do the sort of uh, the local run from my hometown to Toronto, but honestly, that'd be a lot of flying over trees, which is not terribly interesting. Um, so maybe something European. Anyway, if you've got an idea of a, a flight that we might be able to do in something like 20 or 30 minutes, let me know. I'm, I'm really interested in, in trying something like that. Anyway, I guess it wouldn't be right if we uh, finish this without a crash, right? So let's go ahead and just... Let's land roughly, as opposed to crash outright. There we go. Uh, I believe... No, oh, we're still running. Were we smoking, though? Yeah, see, we're smoking. We've, we've been damaged. So we can do a little bit more of that. Now, nah, let's just crash all the way down. Goodbye, cruel world. And unfortunately, you don't get a proper explosion. It does just reset you at that point. It's like, you fool. What did you do? Uh, where did it put us? Really? It put us back where we landed. I guess the, the closest place to it. You can see the, uh, the runway here is actually um, not actually flat and level. And the reason for that, by default, in X-Plane, the runways do follow the curvature of the ground, which is good, but you can see in something like this, it would make for a really, really rough landing and takeoff. Uh, and runways really are supposed to be level, so one of the options we can toggle, which is probably a good idea, honestly. Uh, rendering options. We can runway follow terrain contours. Let's turn that off. Oh, we may have to actually restart for that to take effect. Oh, that's unfortunate. It makes sense, right? Because they, they've already figured out the uh, the mesh of this area. Um, but if you toggle that, then the runways will always be forced to be completely flat. You might end up with a bit of, like, steep terrain around them. Um, but, you know, ultimately seems a little bit more reasonable because that is pretty darned rough landing. I love how it's got, like, the dark spots where all the planes actually land. You know, kind of realistic. There are even higher resolution um, uh, runways if you want as well. But there you go. Quick look at X-Plane 10. It is available on Steam and I would recommend getting it there if you're interested in getting it as opposed to buying it directly from the website just for convenience factor. Uh, the website mostly requires that you order DVDs for it and also have the discs in the drive to play the game. Whereas if you have it on Steam it's just there. But especially if you try to download a lot of the Seagreen packs, um, it will... Uh, it, uh, it will take a while to download because scenery is very, very time consuming and certainly looking for, you know, very specific airports and things. Again, this Pearson Airport is one that I specifically downloaded to have it. Uh, and that can take up a lot of your time. Just like, it's not as bad as modding Skyrim or something like that, but uh, you, can, you can still take up a lot of your time to do that. Make sure you have a lot of hard drive space. There's Toronto way over there. We flew from there. How awesome is that? And as far as I know, all of the, uh, the real world distances are accurate. Uh, unlike something like um, the Euro Truck simula Simulator, where, you know, something that would take 10 hours to drive instead takes about 10 minutes to drive. Uh, so in here, everything is totally accurate. So um, we couldn't take this little plane and fly across the Atlantic, for example. Maybe it would be technically possible if uh, we turned off fuel consumption. I don't know if you can turn off fuel consumption ordinances, if you want to play some uh, military ones. Um, but a fuel total, see, we didn't have that much we can go and constantly just refill our fuel tank whenever we need to. Uh, so we never have to worry about actually running out of fuel if uh, if you were worried about it. But there, anyway, um, I will see you guys next time. And yeah, if you've got a good idea for flights, I may or may not make more videos for this, um, but uh, I, I want to fly them, so let me know. See ya.